imagine it's 2025. That's eight years from now. You wake up and say, good morning, Google. <laughs> and she responds with the weather, what's on your calendar for the day, as well as personalized news just for you. You then turn to your sleep tracker and you ask it, how did I sleep last night? She responds with your sleep patterns. Then you start to do your morning yoga and meditation with your smart breathing device, which will now let you know if your breaths aren't deep enough. You then go into your bathroom and you start brushing your teeth with your connected toothbrush. And as you gaze into your mirror, your mirror lights up and it starts talking to you. And it lets you know that traffic is heavy and that you need to order your driverless car ASAP. <laughs> so you use your mirror as a touchscreen and order your car to come quickly. You then rush to your refrigerator and you ask it what can be made in seven minutes. Your fridge responds with eggs over easy, then automatically orders new eggs to be delivered via drone. So you have enough for the next morning. You scarf down your breakfast, you walk out the front door, and then you tell your door to lock itself on your way out. And then you step outside and put on your augmented reality glasses, <laughs> which makes your approaching driverless car look like a purple dragon. You enter your fire-breathing vehicle and then proceed to check your smart glasses for any notifications that you may have missed. And that was all before 8 a.m. Wow. The future is coming quickly. And we are entering an amazing world of voice-activated technology and interacting with smart devices in a whole new way. But what are we giving up? Think about it. We are giving up those moments of stillness and introspection where we can think, dream, and reflect on our own lives. We used to think and let our minds wander when we drove our cars. But now our cars are talking to us and they're interrupting those thoughts. While we were waiting for anything, we used to sit there in our chair and think. And now we're distracted. And we used to sit on the toilet and reflect on our day. <laughs> but now, we're scrolling. <laughs> and soon, you won't be reflecting in that mirror, but your mirror will be interacting with you. In my moments of stillness, I've been able to reflect on my life and dream big. Like that time when I was 16 years old and reflected on a childhood dream of swimming with the sharks. I then started planning a shark diving trip behind my mother's back. <laughs> but I will never forget being a junior in high school and being at 120 feet on an old shipwreck surrounded by sharks. That's a moment I'll never forget. And that moment made me realize that my thoughts made this a reality. And I started thinking about all different parts of life. I thought about what I wanted to major in, where I wanted to go to school. I thought about the type of people that I wanted to surround myself with. I thought about the type of company that I wanted to work for. 
And that type of thinking even led me to move across the country during a recession and even landed a dream job. When was the last time that you sat down in complete stillness and reflected on your life? But in an increasingly connected world, we are losing those moments of stillness where we can think, dream, and imagine. Did you know that we touch our phones 2,600 times a day? 2,600. Studies also show that one out of 10 people check their phones during sex. <laughs> what the heck are they doing? <laughs> Looking for a how-to manual? <sighs> and a study from the University of Virginia showed that 67% of men and 25% of women would rather shock themselves with an electrical shock than sit there alone with their thoughts. An outlier in the study actually shocked himself 190 times. <laughs> but we are coming to the point where we find it unpleasant and hard to sit there alone with our thoughts. And we've all had that panicked feeling when we thought we left our phone at home. <laughs> this problem is getting worse. Right now, the average home has 10 connected devices. By 2020, that number is expected to be 50. And right now, many of these devices lie in our palm or on our wrist or in our thermostat. But just last month, Facebook's chief scientist has predicted that phones will be glasses by 2022. We are now going to be receiving those notifications and distractions right in front of our eyes. And these type of smart devices are part of something that you may have heard of called the Internet of Things, or IoT, which is simply a network of connected devices that are able to collect and exchange data using embedded sensors. Current examples are your Google Home, your Amazon Echo, your Fitbit, your smartwatch, your Nest thermostat. But what are these companies getting in return for offering us such luxuries? They are gathering hordes of information about us in digital form. Companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon want to increase our engagement with their platforms. Did you know in 2012, we spent on average seven hours a month on Facebook, and now we spend 25 hours a month on Facebook? And Facebook has this way of drawing us in from those bright red notifications, which gives us that much-loved dopamine high to their sophisticated algorithm which tailors the content on your newsfeed. And Facebook works to keep us scrolling. It's essentially the slot machine effect. You never know what's going to come next. And companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon leverage eye-tracking studies so they can understand where our eyes are landing on the page. But as we grow with technology, these companies are going to understand where we are looking in all parts of life. And coincidentally, Google just bought an eye-tracking startup and its patents in Q4 of 2016. 
Google knows what we search, what sites we visit, how we engage with those sites, and with our new personal assistant, Google Home, it now understands what we're doing offline. But with the rise of voice-activated technology, what really is offline? Now, I am not anti-technology. In fact, I own a Google Home and an Amazon Echo in my own home. And I am intrigued by our behavior online. And a big part of what I do for my work is study and analyze the searches that you type into Google. That's right. <laughs> Those deep, dark, personal searches that you thought no one would ever see. And there's some weird searches out there, let me tell you. <laughs> like the 118,000 annual searches in the US for, does farting burn calories? <laughs> or the 10,000 annual searches for, is drinking urine healthy? I wonder if it is. But we are struggling with our relationship with technology. Here's a word cloud of searches that we are typing into Google, sized by US demand. The bigger the word, the more searches there are for it. Cell phone addiction. That has 34,000 annual searches. And that's just in the United States. The kicker, 59% of those searches are made from a mobile phone. <laughs> and when we look at the month over month growth trend for this keyword over the last four years, you can see this problem is not going away. And we are now turning to Google to answer trivial and important questions that we have. I'm going to give you a moment with this word cloud. We are now asking Google questions that we used to ask ourselves. Where should I live? What should I major in? Who should I vote for? We are losing confidence in our own decision making and we are turning to Google to validate the questions that we have in our head. Now, I've had my own personal struggle with technology. It was just five years ago, my boyfriend asked me to go for a morning bike ride. We biked down the street, and we came upon a footbridge. As we crossed over, as we crossed over the footbridge, Luke stopped to take a picture of the water below us. Instead of soaking up the view, I then turned my attention to my phone. But when I looked up from my phone, I didn't see him standing there anymore. But he was down on one knee, holding my great-grandmother's ring. I missed him getting down on one knee. That's a moment I can never get back. And to this day, I wonder what moments, thoughts, ideas, or dreams I've missed out on because I was distracted. 
and we are all increasingly becoming more distracted. Now, I do not have a solution to this problem. I love my phone. I love interacting with Alexa in our kitchen. But I know that my big ideas come when I'm away from technology. So a few things that I'm doing are those apps with the bright red notifications. I moved them to the last page of my smartphone. I bought a watch, <laughs> a regular watch. I'm a millennial with a regular watch. But I found that so many times I was checking my phone for the time, then I would check my messages, then my email, and then Facebook, and I was being pulled into this world. And now I can just look at the time. And something that I have to do now is I have to schedule time in my calendar to be unplugged. Because that is when I dream and think and imagine. And that's where the magic happens. And though I don't have a foolproof solution, I'm here to shine a light on how connected we are today and how connected we are about to become. So I ask you to join me in pondering this question today. How will we balance our time between our thoughts and our devices? so we can best serve our dreams, our imagination, and our ideas. Thank you.